Today's guest is Greg Hain. Greg is the Chief Innovation Officer and Executive Coach at Hain Coaching Group. Thanks for coming on the show, Greg. Sure, glad to be here. Well, I grew up in the household of a commercial general contractor in Ohio. And in the early to mid 1980s, the economy in uh, Toledo was not doing all that well. It's, it was tied a lot to the, the uh, Detroit auto industry. And um, so um, I moved to Columbus, which was booming, uh, to open a branch office to do commercial roofing work. And um, my father, uh, who was the president of the construction company, said, why, why do you want to do that? I said, well, you know, as general contractors, we have three problems, plumbers, painters, and roofers. <laughs> and because when they don't perform, uh, it slows our jobs down. Or in the case of roofers, we can't get our retainage at the end of a project or whatever. And, and I said, I think if I do a good job, people will beat a path to my door. And he said, go for it. Well, people did not exactly beat a path to my door, but I was, I was successful at it. But when the mid '90s rolled around, late late '90s, I reached a point where I was sick and tired of being responsible for irresponsible people. I was uh, sick and tired of having to decide at four o'clock in the morning what time it was going to rain that afternoon, because I wanted to tear off that day. And um, so, consequently, um, uh, there was stress from I wasn't having fun, and. Um, uh, I was having the year I retired from that business. I was having an exceptionally good year. I'd had record profits. I'd had remarkably low stress and I still wasn't having any fun. Mm. And so um, I said to myself, do you really want to do this the rest of your life? I said, no. In about 30 days, I decided to retire and I closed my business. I made sure all my employees had work with other contractors. I made sure all my clients had, I hooked them up with roofers that I knew that I thought would be good for them, um, paid all my bills and closed my business. And I had no intention of becoming a roof consultant, but I eventually did. I had a, uh, a very good client um, stop me in the hardware store one day. And he, he said, Hey, Greg, when are you going to start doing those surveys for us again? And I said to him, Charlie, I'm really not interested in doing those surveys anymore. And he poked me in the chest. He's a very nice guy. He didn't do this in a malicious way, but he poked me in his chest with his finger. He said, no, I, you don't understand. I want you doing that. And, you know, when I retired, I, I didn't plan to not work ever again, but I didn't know what I was going to do. But I went home and told my wife, I said, when they get in front of you in the hardware store and start poking in the chest, maybe you ought to pay attention to that. And so... Mm -hmm. So I became consultant, and I have been a roof consultant since the mid-90s, over 20 years now. And, um, and I got back all the clients I had mm. where it made sense for me to be their consultant. And um, I got to do everything about what I was doing that I love, which was helping people solve problems, but I didn't have to worry about who was going to not show up, who was going to be in jail, and what time it was going to rain that day. <laughs> so... So that worked out, that worked out well. And so now I'm working with contractors and um, one of the things that I discovered is that, um, you know, to put a new roof on a building takes maybe two weeks or two months or whatever, but then we're gonna live with it for 20 years. So I spent a lot more time in my role as roof consulting working with the service departments of roofing contractors than working with their production departments. And what I discovered about most commercial roofing contractor service departments are they are horrible. They are just terrible. And except there are some that are absolutely outstanding. And it made my life so much easier when I could work with one of them because with most contractors, you call them on the phone and they don't return your phone calls mm. or they, or you ask them a question. They say, I don't know, but I'll find out. And they don't get back to you. It's ridiculous. But then there's these other contractors that they do all the things that you would expect a normal business to do properly. And they do it well. And I became dissatisfied. And I said, why, why is this guy so good? And this guy down the street, that's got an equally good reputation in the market but they're just terrible. And so I started interviewing these people. 
And because I'm not a threat to them and I know all these people, they would, they would tell me what they were doing. And so I started by interviewing the contractors that were really good and getting their best practices. And then I started interviewing the contractors that weren't so good. And I discovered that the people that were really good had some common beliefs and the people that were not so good also had some common beliefs and those were different. Hmm. And so I, I walked into a contractor's office one day and we were chatting. I said, you should try this in your service department. And I gave him something to do. And I was back there three months later. He said, hey, that really worked. You have anything else? So I gave him another idea. And he tried that. And three months later, he said, you need to come in and train us because everything you've told us to do works. And I said, man, I am not a trainer. I'm a roof consultant. He said, no, you're going to do this. <laughs> so I went in and trained them. And at the time I trained them, they had two service, two full-time service bands. Two years later, they had six. Mm. The revenue per truck, they think, went up about 40%. So they were delighted. He said, you need to be selling this. Mm -hmm. So I eventually built a training program, which is called Creating Great Service, which I market to contractors. So that's kind of the history of, 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 of how I got to where I am. And then as a result of the work that I've done with contractors, two other things have occurred. Um, I, I became, well, this is, I, be, I became a coach because a lot of times I don't know the answers and I need to draw the answers out. So that's what coaching does. And, um, and then I said to myself, wait a minute, I have become this clearinghouse for best practices. And when somebody doesn't have an answer, they call me. I said, why don't I just get all these people together in a room? So I started facilitating peer groups. And I now have peer groups that I run for commercial roofing contractors where we bring non-competing contractors together from around the country and two, three times a year. And we, we sit down and we spend a day and a half working on our business. And then also in the process of all this, I became an EOS implementer because I know some people that have done EOS and it's helped them. And I wanted to help the contractors. And so I became an EOS implementer. So that's kind of my thing. When you first sort of um, got to a point where you said, maybe I'm not having fun or I'm not having fun, was it easy for you? Because you said the business was profitable. Was it easy for you to walk away from a profitable business? Uh, that's a really good question. So, um, I, so it, it got to a point where it was easy. So mm -hmm. as a contractor, you know, I've had every problem a contractor can have, I've had. Our my own version. And when I talk with, the, you know, I've got 20 some contractors in peer groups and I listen to their problems and, and I relate to all of them and they know I do. So when I was struggling as a contractor, I was making money, I always made money. But as I was struggling, my wife would say to me, Greg, you need to quit. And I said, look, the time to quit is not when you're at the bottom of the bucket and everybody's dumping manure on you. Okay? <laughs> it's when you're on top of the hill and you can see clearly. And I remember a day when um, I was, I, I remember right where I was standing, uh, this customer uh, is still a customer of mine. I was on one of his roofs in Columbus, Ohio. It was just a great day. It was sunny. I had had record profits for the year in July. Um, and I said to myself, I don't want to do this anymore. And because I had clarity, um, I said, I quit. And I literally closed the business as I shared in about 30 days. So there was a period where there was struggle involved in, in what I was going to do. And I did not know what I was going to do. I had accumulated enough money. I didn't have to work the next day. And I thought about going to back to school to get a degree in counseling so I could help people. Um, my, my spiritual life has always been important to me. And so my, my metaphor is that I get these orders that I'm supposed to do something. And um, I don't want to do them. I mean, let it really, but... <laughs> But once, and so the metaphor is I'm asked to go out on the end of a limb, turn around and saw it off. That's the metaphor. And boy, there's a lot of kicking and screaming as I'm going up the tree and out on the limb. But once I 
have gotten clear that this is what I'm supposed to do, then I really become fearless and I turn around and I fear goes away. I just saw off the limb and away we go on the ride. <laughs> and uh, every time I've done that, things have gotten better. You mentioned uh, you interviewed these, uh, these people that are doing great stuff. Um, what are some of the things that you sort of pulled out of them uh, through these interviews? <laughs> well, the, 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 the first best practice, and yeah. it remains for me, the keystone best practice of the service department for commercial roofers is how long does it take for you to get your repair invoices out after you do a repair? And when I started working with that one contractor, they were doing their invoicing once a month. And that's just absurd. <laughs> so the, 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 the analogy that I use is, okay, you walk into the grocery store without an appointment. You get to go through there with two big shopping carts or a little hand basket, and you get to take whatever you want and put it in there, and you walk up and put the food on a belt, and some pimply-faced kid who has not graduated from high school yet instantly gives you an itemized invoice. How long does it take you, Mr. Ruffer, to get your invoice out? Well, it's not the same. Well, it is to your customer. And the, to, to extend the metaphor, just imagine what it would be like if when you went to the grocery store, they gave you a claim check and said, come back in three hours and we'll have this added up for you. Just only three hours. And because every grocery store and every convenience store is the same way, this is the norm. And, and so what you do is you take the claim check and you go down to the local Starbucks and you sit there and you read the newspaper or you get your laptop out and you do a little until your three hours is up and then you go back and stand the line again you give them the thing, they give you your, your, you give them the money and, and they go get your food and they give it to you. And would that be okay? And people are going, well, heck no, that wouldn't be okay. And I say, can you imagine what would happen if when the first grocery store in that environment started handing out itemized invoices and they go, oh, I said, that's what's going to happen to you when you do that. Because I had a contractor that they would we would send them out and the next day they would do the repair and the day after that we'd have the invoice and we knew what was going on. We understood what would happen. We knew what the next steps were. We never had to call them on the phone. They gave us all the information we needed and it was just so nice. But the problem is, but think about the grocery store that gives you the claim check. Okay. Understand they give you the claim check. Then they got to take your ice cream and put it in a freezer, your beer, put it in a cooler, dry goods, put it in a box, label all that stuff while they add it all up. And that's what most roofing contractors offices look like when they prepare invoices. So my role as a trainer was to help them, first of all, understand the importance of doing that. Secondly, help them understand how they needed to navigate the change from where they were to where they needed to be in order to get that done. So that, but to answer your question, Tots, that's, that was the first best practice and it still is. <laughs> I just did some, I just did a, um, uh, a LinkedIn video post just uh, last week and I made a case for why this is important. So it still is the litmus test for how good a service department is. Mm. And those people that are getting their invoices out next business day invariably are doing everything else well. You have different peer groups. So you yeah. hear a lot of challenges that these contractors and roofers have. Uh, what sort of common themes come out in these, uh, these groups? So do you want their common theme or do you want my common theme? I'll, I'll take your common theme. <laughs> My common theme is that all these, first of all, we curate the people that we allow in the groups. We just don't let anybody in. We, first, we wanna make sure there's, there's no competition. So the different geographic areas, we wanna make sure they're similarly sized, but we also wanna make sure that they're good human beings. Because if you take somebody that, when you take a room full of people where everybody in there has high integrity and you bring somebody in there that doesn't, it will stand out right away and it will become a problem and it will ruin the group. So we curate the membership. So we're starting with the premise that everybody in these groups is a good quality human being. So from my perspective, what I see is that most of them have never trained to be leaders. They have grown up in the roofing business and they are roofers 
And many of these people are very successful, but they've really never been trained to be leaders. And um, of course, EOS doesn't train you to be a leader, but it puts in place pieces, as you know, that can help leadership grow and give them a guideline for how to lead. Um, so they've not been trained to be leaders. Uh, most of them struggle with delegation. They, uh, they like solving problems. And so when someone comes with them with a problem, their in instinct is to want to solve it. But the dysfunction that this builds is that everything has to run through that individual. And that individual, the boss in this case, kind of becomes Grand Central Station for all the decision-making processes that go on. And that really holds the organization back when that contractor reaches a point in his evolution as a business person that he can't do anymore. And some are better at delegating than others, but eventually the number one thing that holds a company back is the boss. Now, circling back to they've never been trained as a leader. Well, how do you approach training them as a leader? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, because you brought them in, you're, 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 you're trying to help them along the path. I mean, one option is they're not a leader and they're out, but like some people, you know, maybe they have the capacity to step up. How do you approach that? So there are people in these groups that want to grow. And they don't. So there's two reasons. There's two reasons people don't grow. Either they don't know how or they don't want to make the effort. Mm. When you get when you get past all the noise, either they don't know how, or they don't want to make the effort. My my feeling is, in these groups, as the facilitator, it's not my job to push people to do something they don't want to do. Mm. So what happens in the group is there's people sitting there, and for instance, I have a peer group where um, I put them in the group because they wanted me to come train them. I said, no, you don't have enough trucks. I'm not going to come train you because the training won't work unless you have more trucks. So why don't you join the group and then I can coach you in the context of the group. And we can, so we had three contractors we put in, and I believe that when we started, each of them had two trucks. Hmm. Two years later, one of them has seven trucks. One of them has four trucks. One of them still has two trucks. Now, the person that has not grown their service department at all is sitting there, and they are now starting to feel the pressure because everybody else is growing, and they're not. And mm -hmm. so now, I don't have to say anything. The mirror comes up in I front of them, and they got to look in the mirror. If they come to me and they say, we want you to help us with this, then... I will engage them, okay, so you might want to consider using EOS. Um, you, um, you might want to, and, and again, then I tailored my response to, because I know these people. It's not like I've spent 20 minutes with them. I spend weeks with them in these meetings off and on. I know all of them well. And so I'll, I'll sometimes I'll coach them a little bit. Uh, I, I will tell them where I think their weaknesses are and what they need to improve. But I don't push because I'm very good at pushing <laughs> and I don't want to push people away. Um, so, um, but then they also have the group. They'll ask the group, how do I do this? And the group will give them the feedback and, um, and then some take the, take the invitations that they receive and move forward. And some of them are still struggling with that. Yeah. And, so, and the fact of the matter is the people that have taken the invitations that have gotten better, everybody reaches a ceiling. Yeah. We all, you're going to grow and then you hit a ceiling. And as you know, from EOS, if you've talked to Mike Payton, you get to a certain point and you get stuck. And then one of three things happen. Either you stay there or you go down <laughs> or you go up. And most people stay or go down. So how have you sort of broken through some of your ceilings? Like what were the things that are kind of holding you back uh, at different phases? Well, as a roofing contractor, it was my, in a, I was a perfectionist and it was my inability to delegate. And so I, I mean, that absolutely held me back. Um, and 
um, we do um, disc assessments on the, many of the people that we work with. And of course I've done them and I have a, 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 a battery of them that I've done, but, but on one of them is, is a, a series of developmental skills and my teamwork score is a perfect zero. <laughs> okay. Zero, that's not good. Okay, because we want to a hundred is as good as you can get, zero is as bad as you can get, just so we're clear on that. Yeah. So I'm 67 years old. I have one part-time employee. And what I have done is I've understood that that's a weakness and I built a business that doesn't rely on me to have a bunch of I play to my strengths. Mm. Um so, but a limiting factor for me was my, in a, as a roofing contractor, was my inability to delegate. As a consultant, it's much more of a one-man band kind of a thing. And I had a concierge type practice. I have a concierge type practice where they get a lot of personal attention from me and they compensate me for that. And I'm okay with that. Um, I now have an assistant, you know, and, and she's part-time and she's absolutely outstanding. Um, but um, that, that's my, one of my big weaknesses. Um, but one of my other weaknesses is I do not have a lot of diplomacy intact, <laughs> but I've turned that into, you know, talk about taking lem lemons and turning into lemonade. I've done that because these contractors that I work with tell me, you know, we have a whole building full of people that spend all their time telling us what they think we want to hear. <laughs> and Greg, you don't do that. And sometimes we don't like what we hear, but we know that you mean it. And we know that you're giving us your best shot. And we also know, even if we don't like it, that you have our best interest at heart. So uh, there's another example where I've taken a weakness and I've played it into, I wouldn't call it a strength, but um, when someone comes to me and they ask me a direct question about what I think, they're going to get a direct answer if I can give them a direct answer. I'm not going to weasel. One of the things I sort of ran across, uh, I think one of your vi videos or articles, you talked about, uh, I think it's cost recovery. Recovery was a big... Recovery. Big oh, I love yeah. recovery. Yes. So this is a great... Do you want me to talk about recovery? Absolutely. Okay. So, so this is a great example. So let me, let's back up a step. Sure. Roofing contractors have no clue what knowledgeable building owners want and need. They think that when they go out and fix a roof, it's about fixing the roof. That's just the start of it. It's about, re it's about the communication afterward that's important. Because as well, we've already talked about invoy, and by the way, I haven't forgot recovery, but... but, but, <laughs> but but let me, let me circle back. Sure, sure. The reason, the reason invoices need to be in somebody's hand but next business day is because it lets them know what happened. It is not just a request for payment. It is a communication document for the building owner. All right. So a knowledgeable property owner has all sorts of considerations that they have to deal with. And for instance, if you own shopping centers... You know, on a typical shopping center, the mechanical equipment on the roof is the responsibility of the tenant to maintain. So when a roofer goes up, when, so the tenant calls in a roof leak. And so they, we, send, we send the roofer out and he goes up on the roof and he discovers that the HVAC unit is frozen up like a popsicle <laughs> because it's lost its coolant and, it's, it's, and the condensate pan is overflowing and the water's dumping into the tenant space. This is not a roof leak. This leak has been caused by the HVAC equipment, which is the responsibility of the tenant. So what a knowledgeable building owner will do is they will take the invoice from the roofer for $650 and they will turn around and they'll send it to the tenant and say, hey, we were up there because of your thing, not our thing. You pay this and they will recover what they paid the roofer. That's recovery. So often what happens is when the HVAC guy goes up on the roof and he takes the door off to, put the, to do the filter, he sets the thing down and he punches a hole in the roof and makes a leak. So it is a roof leak. But because he has made this puncture right next to the unit, we know how it got there. So when the roofer goes out and he takes proper pictures of what he has done. He takes a picture that shows not a hole in a roof with a patch, 
but he takes a picture of the hole in the roof and it shows you how far that hole is from the unit, verifying how it got there. He's then equipping the owner to also send that bill for $650 to the tenant and saying, your guy did this, it's our roof, but you made the hole and recover. So roofers need to document their repairs properly so that a knowledgeable owner can look at it and go, oh, this is recoverable. <laughs> and this is big money. I have a client back in 2017, they recover, They were on track the last time I talked to them, they were on track to recover $100,000. That's real money. I don't care how big you are. And most roofers documentation is so pathetic that you can't, you can't look at the invoice and tell. And then if you have to call them on, and they don't, an owner doesn't have time to call them and ask. And if they do ask, they don't know, I don't know, I'll find out, and they never find out. So recovery is about, uh, for a roofer, if you do your documentation right, it equips your owner to recover your fees. And everybody can do recovery. Joe's bowling alley can do recovery. If his HVAC guy is out there that servicing and punches a hole in the roof, if the roofer gets the invoice to him quickly, then before he's paid that HVAC guy, he has proof what the problem was. If it takes him a month to get the invoice there, he's long ago paid that HVAC guy. He can't recover that. So recovery is potentially huge for a knowledgeable building owner. Another theme that I, I, I notice a lot is uh, selling on value, not on price. Um, it's, it might be open a big can here, but uh, tell, me, tell me about that. If you are having a comp in the service business, now I'm not talking about the production side, but on the service side, if you are having a conversation with a building owner about your price and you have worked with them before, your service isn't very good. Because when your service is truly good and you are head and shoulders above your competition, which doesn't take much, they don't care what the price is. They really don't. Um, when we have trained contractors in the past, we would go in and do a um, pre-training assessment with using a uh, survey monkey. And we would ask everybody to categorize, to respond to a whole series of categories about how good are you on a scale of one to 10. And then when I would go in to train, I'd show them the results and the best score. First of all, the only people that ask me to train them are already good contractors. Okay, the best score I have seen for any contractor on a scale of one to 10 is a four and a half. And so I would stand up in front of them and say, okay, you guys have rated yourselves as a four and a half on a scale of one to 10. So let's understand this is not me telling you you're not very good. This is you telling us you're not very good. <laughs> the good news is there is a tremendous amount of room for improvement. And it's really not that hard to get that improvement if you just put your attention on it. So the, the, to get better is not that hard. You just have to put your attention on it. Mm. Do, you, uh, do you suggest uh, any, any methods to measuring it? Oh, there's a very simple measure and it's very reliable. <laughs> okay, it's revenue per truck. Mm. When you are doing a great job at service, people, a, a great example, I have a contractor that I started working with in Florida many years ago. Mm -hmm. I inherited him. So I have a client. They bought this property. I inherited this guy. And this guy was good. I only had the one property with that client. But I had another client. And I quickly, over the period of about 18 months, moved him over to start to work with that other client. That client eventually had 35 shopping centers in Florida. And this particular contractor was the contractor of choice for probably 20 of them. He was somewhat geographically limited. He was probably doing in excess of a quarter million dollars worth of service work for us a year because he was so good. We, you, so if you're really good at service, your revenue per truck will grow. Yeah, what's a good revenue for, uh, per truck uh, number? 
So that's a great question. And it depends upon how much you charge, because in some parts of the country, somebody may be charging $50 an hour for each man and two man crew, and somebody else may be charging $100 an hour for each man and two man crew. So I have a formula and the formula is you take the rate you charge for each man in a two man crew, not what you pay, what you charge. And you multiply that number by 3,600. So if you got two men and you're charging them 75, you're charging $75 for each man, you take $75 times 3,600. That's, um, oops. 3,600 times 75 is $270,000. That is pretty normal. If you're doing that, you're a typical roofing contractor. If you're not doing that, you're not very good. (laughs) I would expect a performer, based upon that same rate, to be doing $400,000 per truck. And the people that are truly outstanding will be doing $550,000 or more per truck. I know a contractor last year with 18 trucks and in October, he was on track to do $600,000 with a truck based upon that $75 an hour rate. Wow. And the thing is, once you've gotten that, that the, after that you get to that $270,000 of sales, the rest of that sales, your costs don't change. It's just added revenue that drops right to the bottom line. So you take your hourly rate, and if you really want to know what you ought to aim at, it's your hourly rate for one man in a two-man crew times 5,400 to get you, then you're pretty good if you can do that. But there are people that are better. A lot of the guests, actually, they, they recommended you to, to come on the show. So you're a busy, <laughs> you're a busy, busy guy. I am. Uh, <laughs> what are your top uh, three habits or routines for success? Uh, so... The first habit and routine for success is daily meditation, Mm. quieting the mind. Um, So that is a spiritual practice for me. Um, And um, I find that um, day in, day out, nothing much happens, but over time, clarity happens. Um, It's a spiritual practice. Divine grace enters into the process. Um, We have really not talked fully about the journey. How many times I have walked out on the end of a limb and cut it off. We've not talked about that uh, in all of the times I've done that. But what I see is there's divine inspiration in it. So that number one is quiet time. Um, and most roofers don't want to do that. In EOS, we talk about clarity breaks. You take a pad, you go down to the coffee shop, and you write, and you get clarity. And most of them fight tooth and nail to do that. And it's a mistake. Um, so number one would be getting quiet. Um, number two is I think it's really important to have, have a daily routine. Um, number three, um, is exercise. Uh, I am a bicycle rider. And if I'm not riding outside, I'm riding inside uh, almost every day. But um, what you only ask for three, the, there's a fourth, there's a sure. fourth in, and that is you have to feed the mind. Um, to borrow from Zig Ziglar, you got to put in the good, the clean, the pure, the powerful, and the positive.